Good morning, everyone. Today is April 6, 2019, and this is John Chappell, Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. Well, that's always a mouthful when I try and say that. Uh, so we meet here every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or 7 a.m. Pacific at this uh, at Fuse. So uh, you can find us at naturalphilosophy.org uh, where you can join our membership. And we also have forums. We're also active in social media where you can find us on Facebook as well as YouTube. And you can find previous recordings of this conference on YouTube. So if you didn't get enough, you can binge watch every one of our Saturday meetings. And if you'd like to help us out, uh, we'd invite you to join hq.naturalphilosophy.org. And the rules of conduct are that we treat all participants politely and with respect, and we should limit our discussions to uh, scientific and logical arguments. And please, no personal tax. Uh, if you say something is wrong, then please also provide a careful reason for why you think that is so. And uh, also, uh, if you are speaking and you have a camera, please turn it on. But otherwise, turn off your camera during the conference to preserve bandwidth. And uh, also mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking. So we have our conference coming up June 26th to 29th. Gosh, I really got to sign myself up for this thing already. So probably I've got to go on the website and sign myself since I'm in Seattle and this is where the conference is going to be. But you guys are going to start thinking about, you know, airfare and things like that. And our no keynote speaker will be Dr. Gerald Pollack. Okay, so today is an open discussion. So this is kind of a place where time when you can discuss things. So I did get an email from Bob Gray. He wanted to share uh, this YouTube channel. So let me go and share that. So Bob, so this is a uh, YouTube channel called Sky Scholar. So uh, why don't you right. go ahead and so, describe that. Um, this, uh, this doctor, I forget his name. Uh, I guess he has a doctorate in um, MRI imaging, etc. But he's really into astronomy and astrophysics and he has Sky Scholar YouTube channel. I'm an absolute fascinating uh, quality. Uh, and, up a little bit. Can I hear you? Okay. You got an echo. So, uh, Very bad echo. I think this chap's name is Robotai. Recording. Yes. That's right. Rob, I think. Okay. I'm just impressed with quality of the presentation. Subject matter is uh, astrophysics, um, models, and explaining why current models are correct, um, where the sun is considered to be just a uh, plasma gas kind of thing and uh, he goes into the history of it he goes into thermodynamics and shows why Kirchhoff's law in thermodynamics is incorrect and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's just uh, I think a very wonderful uh, quote-unquote alternative uh, science kind of YouTube channel and I highly recommend it to everyone here.
he, he seems to have done a lot of work with uh, that Australian uh, fellow, uh, Stephen Crowthers, who's quite a theoretician, actually. But they, they've done some joint work, and I think maybe, maybe even joint videos. Oh, they've got some papers. A cop, he has a lot of papers out of that. Um, you're breaking up terribly for me. I, I can't make out what you're saying, Bob. You're sort of um, breaking up. Can anybody else hear, hear her properly? Franklin, you there? Breaking up for me too. Okay. Yeah, well, I think we might have to come back to this a little bit later, not unless anyone else wants to make some comments on uh, Sky Scholar. Has anyone else uh, watched his videos? I recommend people take a look at the video going further. I mean, start by day they posted. Otherwise, you don't you can get out of order. And um, maybe next week, next people come back with comments and maybe uh, one or two videos with just see or something. Or Scott, uh, Tom, uh, I just want to make a little. Sounds like Bob doesn't have enough bandwidth. Yeah, he was coming in fine earlier before the meeting, but now it just seems. He's being blocked by the man or something. I don't know. <laughs> We're getting too close to the truth or something. But, uh, so here's his uh, thing. So Pierre Mary Robatelle, PhD, is a professor of radiology at the Ohio State University. He also holds an appointment in the chemical physics program. In 1998, he led the design and assembly of the world's first ultra high field MRI system. So he does have a large number of very high quality videos here. Maybe we can just uh, take a look at one just, just as a sample here. Let me hook it up so you can hear the sound. Then maybe hopefully Bob's microphone will come back, but let's just take a look. Back, but I don't talk if you keep bringing up. That's the wrong one. Hello, everyone, and today I would like to return to our study of the corona and outline a few more lines of evidence that this region contains both condensed matter and gaseous plasma, as I had discussed in this paper. The corona is clearly not solely composed of sparse gaseous plasma with a density of less than 10 to the minus 15 grams per centimeter cube, as was proposed in the standard model. You might recall that we discussed the standard model in this video. If you have not watched it yet, do have a look. Perhaps one of the simplest lines of evidence that this region contains condensed matter is that we can directly observe material being ejected into the corona from the surface of the sun, as we can see in this series of videos. Just take a moment to look at these. It is not reasonable to argue that all we are seeing are optical illusions in a gaseous sun. We are seeing real structure, and that implies density and condensed matter. Even in coronal loops, it is not just gaseous plasma that is being seen. You are actually seeing condensed matter here. Coronal loops are likely to be made of type 1 metallic hydrogen, just like the photosphere. This is because the loops are not only a manifestation of magnetic field lines, but also of gravitational forces. As a result, loops can have more material near their bases in response to such forces, as you can see in this figure. Astronomers have explained it this Right, so that's a sample of uh, the videos. So uh, I, I would personally agree with uh, agree with this that when you see mass ejections, that you're seeing mass ejected. So 
I'm not sure that uh, that would that would at all be that controversial. <laughs> what do other people think? Well, ju just on another point, um, one of the things I think he, he seems to be saying in some of the other videos um, is that our observations of things like the CMB are affected very much by uh, the Earth, uh, in particular by the oceans, uh, by, by absorption of the oceans. And I, I think he tends to explain um, so-called perceived alignments of, of say, dipole um, radiation with, with maybe the Earth's equator or the uh, ecliptic by, by the very fact that we're observing these things from the Earth. I think that's what he seems to be saying. What about this specific topic? topic. They got to mute somebody. Mute. Say that again. <laughs> okay, I had to mute you there. Uh, about the specific topic, he's saying that he's claiming that the uh, the corona is not all just gas, but that there is actually uh, condensed matter, which is just regular matter um, coming out of coming out of the sun. So that's the topic of this particular video that we're that we were looking at. You think that's right? I, I find um, his hypotheses quite acceptable, but um, when I watch his videos, I just see you know he's over enacting things. He's just putting things forward, um, maybe without, to my mind, definitive proof. Uh, you know, he's referring to other other sources and so on. Uh, all he, he says is, is eminently um, acceptable, but he doesn't actually prove anything to me. It seems a bit too, too, too simplistic, if I may say so. Well, in this case, it seems to be um, like setting up a straw man because he's saying conventional science says that the corona is just a plasma, you know, just a, a very, very thin gas. And uh, and then he points out these coronal mass ejections, saying that no, it's not just gas, plasma gas. There's actually matter being physically spun out into space. You know what a plasma is, Franklin? Pardon? You apparently don't know what a plasma is. It's an ionized. Yes, ionized. it's an ionized gas. It's so not a gas. It's ionized. Well, not typically the same the thing. Gas. <laughs> It's very, very thin, is, is, is his main point. He's pointing out very, very low density. Well, my comment would be, I'm not sure what he means by condensed matter. Yeah, condensed matter is, uh, I, I, I guess, just a fancy physics term for just matter, what we would normally just call matter. You know, hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen. So that would appear to me that he's only just saying that it's not composed of plasma. There's some unionized material there. Yeah, I think so. That's probably what he would be saying, that it's not this ionized material. That doesn't sound so controversial. No, that's what I was saying. Yeah, I was like, duh. So um, <laughs> this is from the Scientific Journal of Duh. The, earth, the sun ejects mass when it does mass ejections. So, <laughs> but that was only one video. So that's, that's a resource we can, uh, we can refer to. So Bob, is your video, is your audio working any better now? Oh, Why don't you try and unmute yourself. Good. No, we still can't no, hear you. Does anyone know what the uh, scientific proof that the Earth is stationary is all about? That's also uh, can, you, that can you repeat that again? What's the scientific evidence for Earth being what? Stationary. What is the evidence for Earth being stationary? So you'd be wanting to talk to the geocentrists who think that uh, yeah. Copernicus was wrong then. I mean, I think it's the third video on that list you have on the screen. So, from what I understand, long. Huh? 
So from what I understand, I think the best evidence, experimental evidence that we have that the Earth is uh, not moving is that we, we think that we can perform experiments which, which can detect motion uh, according to the speed of light. And if we do those experiments, we find that while we can detect the rotation of the Earth, so we can de detect 24-hour rotation of the Earth using these experiments, we can't actually detect any movement of the Earth itself using those experiments. As it, it is, is if the Earth was stationary within the universe, just spinning around, still spinning, but remaining absolutely stationary. Now, I think it would be interesting, so we could kind of confirm that if we put an experiment, say, on the moon, and it showed that we could detect the motion of the moon around the Earth, but these same experiments still say that the Earth is stationary. So that would be an interesting confirmation of that. Uh, as well, if you look at how the GPS satellite systems work, they basically have to make that assumption that the Earth is rotating 24 hours a day, but that is it is in fact completely stationary um, when making its calculations on how fast it takes to get signals to uh, to a base station. So that's one piece of evidence pointing to the Earth being stationary. Uh, other pieces of evidence basically place the Earth in a special location within the universe. So they've done this, there's this thing called the Sloan Sky Study, where they have just like mapped every single visible star in the visible galaxy. Now, when they do this, they find uh, this funny thing that the Earth seems to be surrounded by these rings of where stars are concentrated. And there seems to be a fairly regular pattern. And uh, we are sitting very close to the middle. Some people say we're not exactly in the middle, but uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's all pointing to the Earth kind of being in this special place. Because we could have been anywhere in the universe, we could have observed this structure anywhere, you know, and the circles could have been like over there. But it, it seems that the Earth is in the middle of those large structures. And I think lastly, the one bit of evidence that we have for the Earth being center of the universe is from the CMBR measurements. So we've measured the changes in the cosmic background radiation, you know, all the way around the Earth. And we find these patterns that uh, in the CMBR. And, you know, there's so there's like some pattern above, there's some patterns below. And we, we find that the axis of symmetry runs right through the axis of, this sol of, our, our, of our solar system. In fact, right through Earth. So it would seem that uh, these, uh, these symmetries we're right in the middle of those as well. How do you know that, Franklin? Um, these are just things we have discussed in the past about what is the evidence for geocentrism. And uh, if you look up something called like the axis of evil, um, this, is, this is the main controversy because that is actually something that's recognized by the mainstream as indicating that the Earth is um, actually at some special location in the galaxy, probably the middle, right? But, but that how does that that make it middle of the universe? Yeah, we're like at the middle of the universe. We're at the middle of the visible universe. Let me see if I can look up this axis of evil so you can see that. I think, by the way, that uh, Hal asked earlier, what do scientists think? Um, well, I, I think the mainstream view would be, first of all, they probably they accept the Copernican principle that everything is um, distributed uh, without any particular alignments and we're not at the centre. But as regards whether the Earth moves or not, they probably think it's a non-question because they totally accept 
the theory of relativity and they say the question as to whether A moves and, and B is uh, stationary or B moves uh, and A is stationary is, is merely one of, of uh, relative motion and is irrelevant. I think th those would be the, the generally held views. But Ian, um, you know, it's kind of confusing because they say Copernicus is right on the one hand. And if you say that, then you really can't say Einstein is right and follow that. Up. That's what's confusing to people. So you kind of talk out of both sides of your mouth at the same time. That's that's kind. Of, so they sort of try to sort to say that the Earth rotates around the sun. And then when you get to the experiments that say that's not the case, then you have to invent this relativity theory to to sort of remove that contradiction. But the relativity theory doesn't work very well because it's got contradictions. So that's really what the problem is. Yes. OK. So here's an interesting quote. I'm sharing this, is, but when you look at the CMB map, you also see that the structure that is observed is, in fact, in a weird way, correlated with the plane of the Earth around the sun. Is this Copernicus coming back to haunt us? That's crazy. We're looking at the whole universe. There's no way there should be a correlation of structure with our motion of the Earth around the sun. The plane of the Earth around the sun, the ecliptic, that would say we are truly the center of the universe. Well, let's go back to this uh, cosmological principle that Ian brought up, which uh, this evidence sort of tends to contradict. The issue is that if you assume the cosmological principle, okay, that there's no privileged position in the universe for the Earth, it makes their equations when they calculate the Big Bang equations and the cosmological equations, it makes them easier to solve. Really? How's that? I, I wouldn't think your origin would make very much difference since they're predicting like some <laughs> origin just like anywhere, right? Well, we can, it turns out yeah, that they can get a solution because there's no center, you see. So any place can be, any place in the universe can be imagined to be the center. And so you only, you don't have to have an equation that describes the whole universe. You only have to have an equation that describes the evolution of the expansion. So does that make any sense to you? Because usually when I think of explosion, I usually think, yeah, there's definitely one center. No, Jan, let me, let me stop you. All they do is calculate the scale factor for the expansion. That's all the, this, uh, these uh, Friedman solutions are just nothing more than calculating the scale factor for the expansion. So that's all they're calculating. So given any random spot in the explosion, they're just calculating the rate, the gradient of the rate of expansion. So it, the, well, that if you assume that the rate of expansion is the same everywhere, then that justifies that being the equation that defines the universe. Does that make sense to you? Which is a problem, right? Considering that, that actual observed explosions, like they would do in Mythbusters, obviously, the rate of expansion. Well, the Big Bang technically isn't a, an explosion. That's kind of a, a you know, a tag that got attached to it that is kind of a misnomer. Really, the Big Bang wasn't a bang. I think they, I think they will admit that there was no quote explosion. <laughs> well, that would be news to me. Uh, I wonder what happens if I bring up Big Bang in Wikipedia. We all know that Wikipedia is the authoritative source on everything, right? The never be wrong, right? It may say, you'll see in a second, um, that, that the term is really pejorative. It was probably introduced by Fred Hoyle in, in saying such right. a ridiculous theory, just call it a Big Bang. He was basically ridiculing the theory. Yes. Yes, it's remarkable in physics how the things that are supposed to ridicule a theory somehow manage to become the endearing terms and the, and the, and the terms that they adopt. I know right? that it's an endearing term. Several years ago, they tried to come up with a different term. And uh, I, I believe it was Sky and Telescope or somebody. They tried to, they had a, a contest or something like that to come up with a different name. And they were not really very successful with coming up with anything. 
you might call it the big inflation. That might be a better word. Well, we already have inflation theory, so that, that term is already taken, right? Well, the reason they use that term is because they're really talking about the expansion of the scale factor. Which apparently has nothing to do with an actual bank. Well, that my point is, as Ian pointed out, that was a, a a pejorative description that that was used to ridicule the idea, and it just sort of stuck. But it, there's no explosion. It's it's what they're really talking about is the expansion of the scale factor. Okay, which is essentially um, how big is space, and um, so space you know, whatever that means is expanding. And the scale factor, these Friedman solutions are basically descriptions of the scale factor. Now, if you go back to the picture that you showed earlier that showed the uh, inflationary universe picture, you had it on there, that one there that's on the right-hand side, that supposedly is a, a, um, a drawing or a diagram or something of the of the scale factor. So the scale factor, you have this inflation um, on the left hand side where the scale factor is is getting larger very quickly. And then suddenly the scale factor increase where it says afterglow light pattern. Suddenly now the scale factor isn't increasing as rapidly as it was before. And if you see these little squares, they're slowly getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go to the right. And that's basically um, essentially representing the scale factor increase. So the universe has been around for 13.77 billion years. Now I'm waiting for them to put up the, the Webb Space Telescope to ever get done with it because that thing is going to be able to look back to the furthest furthest it's going to increase the distance we can look back much much and it's going to be able to look into the 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 invisible infrared uh, spectrum and i think what's going to happen is that they're going to be really embarrassed because they're going to find stars which are like 15 billion years old 20 billion years old 30 billion years old in fact they'll probably find that for as far as that back they can look back they can find stars arbitrarily old well i wouldn't be surprised but the issue is i don't think they'll admit to it they'll probably find an excuse well they'll just modify their big bang theory says oh okay so we found a, a 30 billion year old star so we'll just reset the clock yeah, back. but th this problem's already been addressed already because uh um you know the uh the Hubble scale factor, the rate at which the universe is expanding, um, you know, conflicted with the age of the stars. And because of that, they adjusted, you know, they fudged the measurements of the Hubble constant to make sure that it didn't disagree with the ages of the stars. Yeah, now well, they so sort of settled on it being 72 or something like that which kind of comfortably makes it so that the stars aren't older than the universe. Yeah. The other thing that I heard was that if you calculate how long it takes for some of these uh, galaxy structures to form, it's like way more than 13 billion years. I mean, they can, you know, they have pretty good models of how gravity works and what's in there and what it might've started with. And embarrassingly, uh, it, takes much longer than the galaxy has, I mean, the universe has been in existence to form structures that complicated. So that, that that's another interesting thing I heard. Well, Although, the whole issue of, you know, this whole problem of galaxies and, um, you know, it's really fraught with a lot of assumptions. Um, you know, you have to start from the Big Bang, you know, and then you know, figure out how galaxies could have formed. All of that is really, you know, guesswork more than, you know, it's not really based on substantial facts. And the results that, you know, when you look at the photographs of galaxies, it doesn't really make sense how their theory could, you know, match up with what you see when you look at a picture of a galaxy. Now, this kind of brings up the whole topic of, 
you know, did the universe have a beginning? So that, that was uh, certainly one of the uh, more interesting topics running around the email about whether you can get something from nothing. So if the Big Bang, you know, did occur, then that would have definitely been a case. But here again, um, what, again, basically what that allows them to do is to write equations that say that uh, they can explain it. So in other words, the, uh, the, the theory or the belief is really governed by or driven by the fact that um, they can write an equation. If you don't accept that um, idea that there was an origin of the universe, then their equations can't be applied and they can't claim that they you know, have any uh, scientific description of the universe. They just don't have anything because they can't write down an equation. So the fact that they are allowed to write down a, an equation by making certain assumptions about the nature of the universe is really what drives the belief in those assumptions. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, you're saying that everything is complete nonsense if the universe, you know, was eternally existing. So if the universe was eternally existing, I mean, right now we can only observe the universe within our relatively short lifetimes and within the relatively short time that the technology has allowed to do that. So it's not like we can confirm the Big Bang Theory because no one was around, you know, 4 billion years ago or 13 billion years ago to confirm it. It's just what they're saying is that, well, assuming that there was this thing and then we can write these equations which will eventually spit out the observed universe, which is not a completely unreasonable thing to do, but you know that's kind of the nature of the. Piece. Well, kind of the problems of the the problems arise in the details, which you know now they're sort of finding a lot of problems in the details, which have to do with well now we have to make an assumption about this thing called dark matter because the galaxies really don't behave the way they're supposed to behave, so then there comes in this ad hoc assumption. So now they're adding in these ad hoc assumptions, okay, that keep the whole structure of the belief system, you know, consistent. And um, that's kind of, you know, they also have this thing called dark energy and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you begin to see now that they're adding in these ad hoc modifications because the um, what they're observing doesn't agree with the theory. So, Michael, you have your leg up. Well, there's a, a whole different uh, kind of uh, model other than uh, a big, a random Big Bang that uh, would involve creation. And uh, there, actually, you can make a scientifically uh, rational model out of uh, creation at this point if people wanted to uh, seriously uh, consider it instead of. <laughs> Uh, you know, what the Big Bang and Higgs boson and all that. The idea is that originally you had a universal oscillation which transitioned to a universal vibratory ether, which the ether is uh, composed of elemental building block units, which also form a matrix. And then uh, what you yeah, had... Have to go back to where was the original oscillation coming from? I mean, that's as a significant act of creation as the entire Big Bang. So, well, the, the first cause had to be something. There had to be an or origin of something. It had to be a, a universal okay, oscillation. Don't need, don't need a bun. Oops, someone has someone has um, brought preschool to us. Um, the only uh, yeah. the only possible substrate would have been space itself, original space, which we don't know what original space was like. I mean, it was would have been free of forces, might have been more self compatible, and might have supported a universal oscillation of point localities. Anyway, yeah, still, if, if, has if you to... accept the possibility, I, I could go on with the uh, with this other model, which would be a good, I think, a good alternative to the Big Bang, random Big Bang model, which would be that uh, you had an ether macrocosm, which um, which uh, you had um, foci of, of etheric energy, which were highly uh, highly rarefied and highly intense, and uh, produced. Uh, Energic phenomena which could have uh, initiated well, life, such as magnetic monopoles and so on. I mean, you, then, you, can, you can go on like that, but 
Well, the, the just give me a couple is, more minutes. Just give me a couple more minutes, Franklin. Please. Well, 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 but with, with with all due respect, we we, we have heard your your theory uh, many times. So well, I was going I, I was going to give some new, I was going to give a few new slants on it if you let me. Okay, if you got some new slants on it, then sure, go ahead, go for it. What's your new slants? Well, the new slant would be that, the, let's stick around with the whole creation thing here. Yeah, the creation gives you the whole a whole different look at it, and uh, you would have had a, an etheric entity who who is creation who, who used uh, etheric energy to manipulate um, uh, quantum uh, units, which were uh, which are composed of these elemental ether units. Which are building blocks of the everything that from then on, including quantum units. And if uh, if you have uh, an entity that projects uh, electrons into into a virgin ether region, it would quantize the whole region chain reactionally. The electrons being very speedy, and then the building blocks of the ether uh, forming larger, slower units such as protons and neutrons and atoms. And the electrons speeding by uh, describing curvational arcs around the, the slower nuclei, and then you have also the question of antiparticles, and what what are antiparticles, and what a bit what are black holes all about? And this fits right in logically. I mean, I, I don't have any proof, but then black holes would be creational uh, depositories for uh, antimatter, which had to be. Uh, shunted out of the way of the new quantum uh, universe, the quantum universe being um, designed as a more macrocosmic, stable, magnetically stable uh, environment for uh, for existence, for physical existence. Well, anyway, that's well, Michael. Thing. Um, here's my question. All right, this is um, this is Harry Ripper. Here, here's my my issue with uh, all these theories. Um, the theor when we look out there in the universe and we look at galaxies, okay, and, um, you know, there's a lot of photographs of galaxies you can go on the internet. And, and uh, the question is, how are these objects being formed? Okay, what, what created them? How are they being formed? Now, there's a lot of speculation and theory about that, but my comment would be do you have a, a theory of how galaxies are, were formed and created and why they appear the ways they do which is un, unfortunately uh, they appear in a lot of different um, forms and and um, shapes so do you have a theory that sort of can explain that I think that's really anybody who deals with cosmology I think they have to be able to explain that well there's there are stories in 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 the um, in the occult realm about star gods and uh, uh, so on, and they they have the ability to manipulate etheric uh, forces in such a way as to um, etheric forces being much more rarefied and uh, potentially much more powerful than the quantum units, which are much larger, and they they can be just uh, manipulated and 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 into designs such as a galaxy or a star. I mean, it's just a question of uh, creation, uh, creational uh, intervention well, and uh, manipulation. Well, let's ask the first question here. Um, you know, my question would be, um, does a galaxy form as a result of the cosmological process, which is what the mainstream says? They say that uh, all matter was created in the, in the, quote, Big Bang or the uh, initiation event, the T equals zero, whatever happened after that. And then they have to have a theory that explains, they say hydrogen and helium only were created at that event. And then the hydrogen and helium has to somehow form the structures that currently exist today. But the structures that currently exist today have more than hydrogen and helium. They have all these other elements, um, you know, over a hundred of these elements. Where did they come from? And so they have to have a theory of that. And um, then you have to have a theory of where these galaxy structures came from. Okay, they, they say something like there was a condensation in the fluctuation, um, you know, during the inflation or whatever. I do knows what, what it is. 
and then these galaxies were created. They cond- the gases condensed. I don't. That doesn't make any sense to me. And then somehow these condensed gases created stars and these structures called galaxies. And then you have this re- recycling of the elements through supernova, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of this really makes any sense to me because I don't really see how any of it can work to create what we see when we look out uh, through our telescopes and take photographs. Do you have a way of explaining that? Well, it, it's the question of uh, having these uh, creational entities. Uh, you had an original entity who... Uh, started the quantization of our, of our universe and then we had the universe and then you have these uh galaxies and stars which are uh, more highly specialized uh creational uh units which um the idea is that uh, you, these gods have a certain design so what do you mean by a creational unit i mean i think that's an interesting uh, phrase and um you know well, they, what, you, what does they, that mean they, they could uh, create a star in such a way that there are uh, more uh, neutral or non non energic um, uh, ingredients inside the star that we don't even know are there, but they prevent the collapse of the star, and they allow the uh, hydrogen helium uh, fusion process to proceed. And okay, let me ask you this: Where are the stars coming from? Stars are coming from uh, the atoms and the uh, quantum uh, quantization of the uh, universe, which uh, was formed from a, a, a virgin ether uh, region, which uh, had the electrons speeding through, and then the, the, the speed of the electrons energized the ether units. Okay, so did the stars time, come before began, the galaxies, or did galaxies come before the stars? Well, the stars... Uh, well, you have star gods, and well, it's all part of the same thing. I think it's all a design. And uh, for example, you have these. Uh, there's a certain type of star called a Type A one B or something like that, yes. which always always has the same, all the same properties and the exact same size, and it it, it seems seems to follow uh, a design. And it, and it's very repetitive here and there. They find them throughout the universe and the only way you can explain it to me is that you have you have an intelligent uh, design going on uh, creational design going on that you could have stars uh, a, rep- a repetition exact repetition of a star like that at various places throughout the universe well i kind of like your some parts of your ideas i sort of resonate with me um so you know it's sort of an interesting way of looking at it so I'm, I got found the wiki page, the source of everything, uh, about galaxy formation. So there are a couple theories. There's this like top-down theory, and this has something to do with dark matter. And then you have bottom-up theories, um, where the galaxies break up into smaller clouds. And... And we have formation of elliptical galaxies because we think that galaxies run into each other and form these other kind of pinwheel kind of shapes. So I can believe that. So like this would be an example of, they say like an early galaxy. So early galaxy, not very well structured. It's just a concentration of Yes. That means that the stars formed in the early part of the universe after the Big Bang. That's why yeah. they're called early stars, because they do not have heavy elements. As you can see in this picture, there isn't a whole lot of structure to this galaxy. here. It's just a fuzzy uh, conglomeration of stars. So, so that's not a gas. Those are actually, anything that's bright there is actually a star. And then later on, uh, they might become like this object here, where you can see there's apparently been a lot of collapse and there's a lot of uh, structure in this thing. So this is why I was saying that it, it may take longer than 13 billion years to go from, you know, this to that. And I could believe that. I could think that, yeah, it would take a long time for random fuzzy um, galaxy to turn into nice, neat spiral galaxy 
like that. Although I think that's still not getting down to the main point, which is, you know, even in, you're still saying the word <clears throat> creation. And so in the emails, we were given two choices that, you know, A, that the universe has been around forever, in exactly the way we've seen it, or B, you know, th that there was a, there's been a finite amount of time that the universe has been in existence. So the question is, what is it? Is it A or is it B? So, and this all came up in the context of the discussion, can you get something from nothing? So all of these uh, like creational type theories would kind of say that, yes, that was definitely a example of getting something from nothing, which would allow people to uh, use that as the basis for their theories. For example, you can say that uh, one of the popular theories is that like a, a positron is a source which is constantly spitting out some fluid and an electron is the opposite, which is a sink, which is it's eating that fluid. But of course, the question is, where is the fluid continuously coming out of, you know, the positive charge? And that is, would be an example of getting something, you know, this fluid out of nothing, since there's no apparent uh, source or resource or origin for this continuously continuous outflow. So, my argument was that the answer uh, must be A, that we never see something from nothing, because in our macroscopic world that we live in, we never ever see something coming from nothing. Uh, the, there were some examples of like pulling rabbits out of hats, and uh, I was trying to explain that the rabbit never comes from no, no, nothing, nowhere. It's a trick. The rabbit always came from the parent rabbit, which was being hidden somewhere in the hat. But in the, so in, in, in the observed universe that we currently live in, experimentally, we never see something coming from nothing. What do so, you mean by nothing? I mean nothing. I think we know what nothing is, which is no way. It's just something spontaneously appears. I don't know what that means. That's just vague. Well, if there were, if you were a, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, to say that it came out of nothing means that the rabbit was not in the hat before, that the rabbit materialized, became the rabbit, and that's what the magician pulled out. That would be getting something from nothing. That the, that the rabbit wasn't there. Uh, what, about, uh, what about the creation of uh, uh, positrons and electrons, you know, that they spontaneously are created? That's a known process. Uh, yes, and I would argue, and I've argued many times, that that if we apply the something out of nothing, nothing, or what? What is that? That is that you're pulling out the positrons and electrons that were hidden in space before, just like the magician well, it sounds them. like the magician in his hat. I mean, that's just, you yes, know, that's exactly it doesn't what tell it is. anything. And that means that the positron and electron were not created in any way. That the positron and electron was in the hat that the magician pulled out. I mean, it looks like a rabbit came out of nowhere. And it looks like a positron came out of empty space. But in fact, the positron was in space before. And it just, but that's it just an out. assumption on your part, isn't it? Well, no, this is a logical, this is a logical deduction and in particle. Oh, physics, it's an assumption. No, this is a logical presumption. I mean, if it was any other particle. Oh, well, you're presuming that something particle. that something that has no that you don't know is there is there because you want it to exist because your logic, you know, insists that it has to be because your assumption is that something can't come out of nothing. So based yes, on that exactly assumption, right. that's the basis of your argument. Since nothing can come, since something cannot come out of something, therefore there had to be something, okay, to explain this process. But that's just a, you know, that's just circular logic. No, I think this is this is the the, the entire point of this argument here, and you know, Bill Lucas <laughs> called 
Bill Lucas the point is you made an assumption. This okay, is the point is you made assumption. an assumption, and now you're just it's trying to justify an assumption. that assumption. It's definitely not an assumption. That, that <laughs> something comes from nothing is actually a well-observed experimental fact that we see in our observable I just unit. gave you an experiment that refuted it. No, what you said is actually circular. No, I, I, I gave you an experiment that said that something, something came out of nothing. And, and I told you, you that hypothesized it that there had to be something there to begin with, because your assumption is that something can't come out of nothing. I mean, to me, that's just I, I don't really think this whole discussion really is very meaningful. No, I think it's very meaningful because I believe that if you can believe that you can get something from nothing, then you can believe absolutely anything unrestricted. You can believe, you know, absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to think of something that's completely ridiculous. You can believe that black is white. You can believe three is equal to two. That's all very fine, Franklin, anything. but, you know, what if I what if I see something, okay, where something comes out of nothing, and because I believe that something can't come out of nothing, then I can't accept that observation that exists. And yes, that's correct. That's the uh, that's the observation. And the basic bottom line is what science is saying the whole that. theory of the quote Big Bang is based on something coming out of nothing. Yes, and so if you were, and they're all believing that. that. Yes, and that 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 requires you to believe that something can come out of nothing. That's the point, is that if you believe the Big Bang, then you believe that something can come out of nothing. I mean, fundamentally, you have to do that. But they believe, basically, that the observations demonstrate that. So they claim that's science. That's what they do. And here at the CNPS, we claim a lot of that isn't science. Well, I don't, really, I don't really see that, you know, you know, holding on to an assumption, you know, I, I, I just don't see that as being very worthy to base everything that you believe on an assumption that may or may not be true. Well, it is it, was, it is a base postulate, so maybe Bill can chime in here, because Bill, you often say that the problem with science is basically the elimination of the use of logic in science. So hear me out. So the logic is this. So in our experimental world, anything that we can actually, you know, touch or feel or experiment on in uh, our, our, our world, generally in a macroscopic sense, let's say, because we don't know exactly what's happening in the, you know, sub microscope. But I know that if I see some object here that it came from someplace, it had to be constructed, the atoms that it was made out of were always here and that we can trace an origin to this. This never appears out of, you know, just magically out of nothing, like a rabbit being pulled out of a hat. We never observe something coming out of nothing in the, in, in the, in the macroscopic world, at least, okay? We just, can you agree to that? That generally speaking, this is a principle we observe, that if we see a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, we know that the rabbit did not materialize magically or be transported or was we know that the rabbit had to be in there okay i don't know how the magician did it but we know that and that's what's called magic right but observationally experimentally in the macroscopic you know world that we can touch and feel we never see anything nothing coming out, nothing something coming out of nothing so that's a very basic principle now you could say that that's an assumption but it's an assumption which is backed up by all of our experience. Can I, can so I, have a I turn? feel that that is a great assumption. Now we have to apply it to things where we're not so sure, like uh, this pair production thing that Harry brings up, where we have empty space, we send a gamma ray into a region next to an atom, and suddenly we see a positron and electron pop out of there that did not belong to the atom. It's not obviously a gamma ray. So we're seeing an instance of a rabbit being pulled out of a hat. Now, we can either say, okay, well, our assumption about something from nothing must be wrong because there's something coming out of nothing there, right? That's one way. Or we could apply logic, which says that our basic principle from observation is that nothing can come 
I mean, something cannot come from nothing. Therefore, if we see a positron coming, popping out of space, then by applying logic that we feel that, you know, that that can't be, then the, the only other logical explanation is that that positron was there. And then it's a matter of explaining. Well, that, that, that requires the assumption there. that something that didn't that positron exist came into existence, but it had to exist before, but we couldn't, but we didn't. Have, I mean, that makes no sense to me, Franklin. I'm sorry. It just does not make any sense to me. This argument that you've been using is, is not any sense at all to me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Sorry. Well, do you at least understand or accept that it's reasonable to think we cannot get something from nothing because observationally, experimentally in the macroscopic world, we never see that happen. I don't know that, Franklin. You got no proof of that. Yes, we have plenty of proof. That's okay, like the black me, swan well, argument because we don't proof, observe it in the world in which we exist. Therefore, it doesn't exist. There's a whole yes, universe of possibilities really, out there, and you're basing, a pretty good you're assumption. basing your theory on a whole universe of possibilities that you don't know about. Well, then, if you want to can do that, then show me some instance of something coming from nothing in the macroscopic world. Is there any experiment you can show that demonstrates well, that? Well, the Big Bang, which uh, mainstream science accepts, that's what their assumption is. No, but you can't demonstrate that in a live experiment you know, that you can perform right now in a room. That's what I'm talking about. Any kind of experiment we could perform, we would be able to find that. Well, that's because we live in a limited world. But I also just pointed out one experiment to you where apparently that's not the case. So, you know, yes, that's you're like pointing out of both sides of your mouth at the same time. You're, you're essentially, I don't think this really, this discussion really has any relevance. Basically, no, it is. You know, this uh, is totally relevant because I'm saying that if you can well, believe you don't know, frankly, you can't prove this assumption that you're making. Okay, you can't prove it. I can you're prove making it. it as a I, working you know, hypothesis. I, I Why can don't prove you it. just say that it's a working hypothesis and let's no, move on to something else. The way you make your hypothesis and confirm them is that you go and you try and find experiments that either confirm or deny your hypothesis in this case there's two hypotheses one you can I just explain to you that. one experiment and you you basically just won't accept it okay i no, mean I it's all based on your prejudices you have certain prejudices and the world has to be the way you view it you know but yes, you're I think one little person in this big world that my prejudices would lead you to better science than the prejudices that would lead you to believe that, you know, you can do anything. Give it up, Franklin. Just move on to another subject. I mean, it's a, it's not a subject that really basically you can resolve one way or the other. Move on. Harry, like I said, I want to hear from, so is Bill still here? Because this, this kind of goes to I his, don't think Bill's here. No, he was here. Because I wanted to hear what he did. No, Bill Could is I just there. make one or two quick observations? Um, one is that um, I suppose it's really experimentally impossible to isolate nothing. I, I mean, we, we cannot um, get a system which has nothing in it and then do an experiment to see does it produce something or not. I, I, I mean, nothing does not exist philosophically. You, yeah, you might say, well, yeah, I, I agree. And, and you know, I, I think it's kind of, you know, Okay, and the second point, Harry and, and Franklin, uh, I just wanted to make about the earlier conversation is looking again from the mainstream point of view, the so-called Big Bang, I mean, they say not only did all material come uh, from nothing, from previous non-existence, but time itself and space, time itself did not exist before T equals zero. So time was created at the time of the Big Bang. So therefore, to them, um, it, it, it's a bit um, irrelevant to say, and incorrect indeed, to say the world has a finite uh, lifetime. You know, you're not saying, we, we might say, look, uh, five years ago, such and such a thing happened. But five years ago plus five seconds, uh, things were going on and that hadn't yet happened. That's not what they're saying about the Big Bang. 
effectively they're saying the universe is infinite in time. It's not 13.77 thousand million years old. It's infinite because there was no time before T equals zero. So it, 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 I, I suppose I'm pointing these things out to indicate that there's a bit of a, in, in a logicality there. It's a bit of sort of muddled thinking. The conventional view would be, oh, the world is only 13.77 thousand million years old, and that's, that's the end of it. But they were saying there was no time before that. <clears throat> I suppose it's another example of twisting ideas around to suit what you politically or ideologically want to believe. I mean, just to contrast this, so you have these two possibilities, A or B, either that, you know, it's... Frank, been let's, let's, let's just get off of this A or B, not. you know, you're just setting up, a, you know, you're just setting up, oh, it has to be either A or B because you say so. I'm sorry, you know, we can't decide whether it's A or B, we don't know. Well, certainly it has to be... Why can't you just B? give it a rest? We don't know whether it's A or B. We don't know. Why can't we yeah, leave it there? People are trying to decide that. People are trying to decide well, it. Let them, let them argue about it. I don't. I, I really don't want to talk about it right now. I mean, I, I just think okay, it's then, a then please, argument. Then please stop talking then and let the yeah. other Well, you're the one who's doing talking. the talking. We have to talk about what you want to talk, what you want to talk all the time. It's you, you, you. Well, that's why I'm the moderator, because I'm trying to keep things interesting Thanks. here. So I'm trying to bring up some points here. And the point I'm trying to bring up, though, is that if your bias is towards something from nothing cannot happening, then therefore the only conclusion that you can come up with is you must pick A, which is that the universe has been existing forever, right? That's the only way that something cannot spring from nothing is that if the universe has in fact existed forever. So that drives you in that one particular direction versus if you believe something from nothing is possible, then yes, things like the Big Bang are possible. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I think, say, the Big Bang is wrong. I and mean, this is a way that science uses can select things. Like you say, if you're going to be Nandy Pamby and let's say that everything's possible, then you'll never be able to pick between any two alternatives. So you'll never be able to pick between when you see pair production, you know, what is that an example of matter being created? Or is that a matter of matter being created? kicked out of the ether that's you know those are two choices there and if you have a you know a guiding principle and like you know that is a postulate kind of thing but it is confirmed by everything we observe in the real world so it's not like it's an arbitrary choice then you would have to say that you know it's not a, it's not an example of creation it's an example of existing particle being kicked out I was trying to explain that. Uh, I just think that's all just nothing more than terminology on your part. Okay. No, it's not you're terminology. Just, it you're, just, it, you're just making up words to mean what you want them to mean. I don't know what something out of nothing means. That doesn't really mean anything to me. I don't know don't what see, nothing is. And I'm Bill not sure what here. something is either. So Bill is uh, back here. Bill, do you have any uh, comments on to whether it is logical to think that something can come from nothing, therefore the Big Bang is logical? Because <laughs> I just saw your flag come up. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I'm having terrible time hearing you. <laughs> oh, we, so. we can hear you, so you're good. Okay. Well, um, uh, we. Now you just cut out. By Winston and bringing up Winston Bostic again. The electromagnetic photons, no charge, and he could make an electron. And uh, Bill, we can't hear you. What is he? he what is it? Could you repeat that? I think he's saying Bill uh, uh, could make electrons. So maybe perhaps that's an example of being able to make something. But unfortunately, so I, yeah. And those experiences. 
Yeah, we still can here, Bill, although I'm not sure that would be an example of creating something from nothing, since that would be creating an electron from and, the primordial uh, uh, fundamental kind field. Of, so, uh, you, you see on the video, you see on the inner kind of those making solitons in various liquids, air, water, different kinds of gas, so, So I think he's citing that you can build these solitons out of air and water and gas, although that would also be a case no, of getting something no. from something, right? Well, but we approximate it in a electronic Yeah, unfortunately, Bill, we really can't hear you at all. Indicate that in order to move. That's really unfortunate we're having these uh, bandwidth problems. Uh, Bill, Bill, you're cutting out way too much. So, but, uh, well, why don't I'm, we go on? I see uh, Carl, Carl Reef has, has raised his uh, question. Please. Frank, can I we'll speak a minute? Can yes, Cornelius? Yeah, okay, because I've had my flag up for a while here, but. Uh, I'm not one for uh, taking something out of uh, making something out of nothing either. Uh, however, there is uh, there's got to be an original source of energy, which we can't fathom where that energy came from, regardless whether it's a big bang or the energy within the, the electron or that. What does happen? What can happen is the conversion of energy patterns, and that's essentially what the whole big bang theory. And everything is about is the conversion of energy from one form to another, the conversion of shapes of energy in that. And I think if you look at something like a rogue wave, uh, you'll see that, you know, you what virtually looks like a calm ocean can have all of a sudden a spike of energy uh, created in the middle of it because of the convergence of that energy form. And even if you look at rogue waves, I mean, it'll, it'll, the wave will come together a big, a big strong peak in the middle of nowhere and it's the conversion convergence of that energy that makes that peak and it can be an explosive situation where the water will fly up and and come back down and be uh, become a whole bunch of drops of water and that and that kind of thing happens and then that, then that can happen in a resonant format where then once that occurs additional energy can keep that going and that's the kind of thing that can happen within the Big Bang. That's the kind of thing that can happen when a soliton is created. That's the kind of thing that can happen when an electron and proton are created from the energy coming into an environment where it becomes a resonant form of its own and it stands on its own. From then on, it, it can be absorbing energy from its surrounding patterns. If, if you take a, take a, a pool of water and you drop a rock into it, you get waves. You get one wave to begin with. The waves crash off the sides, the, uh, reflect off the sides, and become more and more complex. Now, in, in a water environment, you're going to get the situation where each individual molecule is going to absorb that wave energy, and eventually it's going to diminish. If there were not that friction, if there were, that, were not that diminishing of wave energy, then you would get a more and more complex wave pattern as it continued to reflect and interact with other waves and the wave energies would become higher and higher in frequency because they would mix with each other more and more. And, and so in that sense, you're going to get something, but it's not going to be out of nothing. It's going to be something out of an original energy source. And the original energy source, I don't think anybody, any of us uh, can come up where, where that energy source is. Are you saying that energy is something? And not nothing. I'm saying energy is what what things are created from. Energy equals mass. You know. But is it something or nothing? That's the uh, you know. That's why I don't like this whole discussion about something or nothing. Because it, can you tell oh, me yeah, whether energy, energy is, is something, something or is it nothing? Well, is energy a word? Well, you've been using it. Everything is something. Right. The thing is, is that energy, strictly speaking, is matter in motion. Any matter which has motion has energy. So 
The problem with speaking about that is that you'd still have to be, I don't know, a presuming a background matter substrate through which energy could be. No, that's not, a, that's not a correct definition. Energy is not matter in motion necessarily. There is also there is also light and electromagnetic waves. Which puts matter into motion. <laughs> which puts matter into motion, but it's not matter in motion. But actually, this is one of those things that, like, like Harry's saying, that, that if you accept a postulate like that, then you would have to say that even light is matter in motion, which means that there must be some background matter in order to give it motion so that you can register that it has energy. It depends on what you want to call matter. Uh, I prefer to call matter, and what, uh, what matter is called this quite often. Stuff like this called matter. It's stuff that I can hold in my hand. So that right, and, and that's, that's the thing is that matter has mass if you look at the definition of matter. Most often, they will con consider matter to have mass. And in order to have mass, that's the conversion of energy to a point source that is that has a gravitational and a inertial characteristic to it. Yeah, I mean, that, I can appreciate that. that I mean, that, that is matter basically. Is is a point source? It, the energy has been focused to a point source. Now, you have uh, people like Roger Mundy who will call it matter, regardless of whether there's a point, a point focal point of that energy within the region or not he'll call anything matter but uh by by most definitions matter consists of mass well it has mass generally speaking all the visible matter that we can see around us are made of three things which is protons electrons and neutrons now that's but but Those electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic waves don't have mass. They affect no, mass. They, they affect ma They affect matter, matter, and they affect mass. They can affect the focal points of energy, but they on themselves are traveling energy patterns. So yes, yeah, so that would be kind of. Uh, I mean, this is the alternative explanation for, say, pair production, is that you know that gamma ray is just some packet of energy. And if you think like the electron is just some like a vortex or something like that, uh, or some kind of wave pattern, a lot of people I think would use that, or some kind of tension, or it does something to space to have it a different characteristic. And so one of them goes spins left hand red, some of them goes spins the other right hand side. Um, then you would see that you're you are getting something as a conversion kind of thing that's, or you're that's changing exactly it. it's a conversion but it's not a something from nothing it's a yeah, something, it's not a something. From it's something kind of a, it's taking it for one different form which is say gamma ray which is some kind of electromagnetic phenomenon to something which looks like an electron or a positron but you kind of have to be able to explain you know how that conversion occurs and that's the question i always i always ask people say oh that's a, or a conversion of a gamma ray to a proton, a positron, and I ask, well, how exactly did that happen? And to which they can only shrug their shoulders and say, no, we don't know how that happens. We observe it happen, so it must happen, right? So, but they have absolutely no explanation how that happens. Now, some people like Cornelius have more detailed explanations about how that may happen um, based kind of on their theories. But the alternative is to just say that positron electron, they were there before. They formed a neutral particle uh, the gamma ray is energy which is used to split the binding energy and those are all well accepted physical phenomenon that we know in chemistry and every other field of physics so i prefer to have explanations which are definable by every other experiment and known process that we know in physics rather than just saying shrugging your shoulders and say well we don't know how that, how that happens that's that that would be my preference yeah, but the problem is you make wrong conclusions. No, I think the problem is is that I make right conclusions and of course, and right. I, so, right. Let's move on to another think, topic. A lot of the people talk. Yeah, I have. I, I, I missed a lot of what you said because is, I was in a call call at the time, so I apologize. But I, I missed your rebuttal, your rebuttal to Franklin. So let's let Carl speak here. He's had this play get through some time. Okay, I have a sort of a related question. Uh, we have electrons all around us, but 
do we only ever see observe positrons as a product of pair production? Yes, we do. We definitely see positrons. Uh, after pair production, you can split them off and store them someplace. Well, do we see them? Do we see? Do they exist in our environment that we can observe other than from yes, pair they production? Do. Yeah, you we, can we, definitely see. we create them quite frequently. They do a thing called a, a PET scan where they create positrons and purposely uh, fire uh, positrons into your uh, body. They're much more effective than, uh, than X rays than that. But yeah, we can create positrons, but they cannot, they do, typically do not exist on their own for a very long time because they annihilate with electrons or converge with other uh, negative charges. Uh, okay. they, do, they do occur uh, in ionization that occurs in the atmosphere from uh, gamma rays and that entering our atmosphere. But again, they get absorbed rather quickly. Electrons are by far and away the most predominant naturally occurring. So then when we do pair production, it's not that the the specific positron and electron that came out of pair production have to recombine. A positron can combine with any other electron to supposedly annihilate. Yeah, that's yes, correct. That would be correct. Yes. Okay, fine. That was my question. Thank you. So I was wondering, why do you, why do you ask that? Does that change your ideas about positrons, electrons, any, or are you just curious? Well, I, I just wasn't aware that they, the positrons existed just normally. I mean, even what Cornelius said about in the upper atmosphere, but he used a gamma ray to say that, you know, it causes them, which is the same as in a, in a laboratory, evidently, the pair production near a nucleus of an atom. So is that the only way that they ever come into existence is from a gamma ray interaction? Uh, no, they, the, when they do collider experiments, the primary product are positron electron uh, particles. It's like, you know, 99.9% .9 of the particles that come out of any power collision is positrons electrons. Okay. Yeah, just so apparently, just if, you, if you look at posit uh, positrons and electrons, you might ask, um, why are they not equally numerous or equally apparent? And, and in, in particular, the electron was discovered long before the positron was. Um, but perhaps one can say, had it been the other way around, you, you mightn't be so surprised. I mean, if, um, if the positron was the generally available particle, which was responsible for carrying charge and so on, and then the negation of that was only exceptional, you mightn't be surprised. Well, perhaps that is in reality the situation. I mean, we only um, call the electron uh, such a negative particle because um, Benjamin Franklin basically, in a sort of 50-50 choice between uh, the, the charge carrier, chose the wrong uh, variable. He, 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 he looked at a positive, he, he, he defined positive electricity which should have been negative, and he defined negative electricity should have been positive. So really, the electron is a is a positron, if you like, and the positron is the negation of that. No, that that doesn't sound quite right because there's a difference in a positron and an electron in, in its sterility, like the magnetic field it will create. You can a, a positron and electron actually have different uh, processional patterns, and so when you run it, when you run send a positron uh, beam out, you will get a magnetic polarity that will be opposite of that of a, an electron. And it, it basically comes down to why does the universe consist of basically matter instead of antimatter? And that uh, has a lot to do, there's a lot of speculation on that in the early universe, how it all got absorbed in that. But the, the fundamental view that I pertain, uh, adhere to is, that you can only have in the universe one type of sterility. Either the universe, if it's rotating as an entirety, if the universal pattern is rotating as an entirety and has a right-hand sterility, everything within it will probably have a preference to a left-hand sterility. Does that make sense? If you're, right if, left, if you're, spin, if you're spinning a bucket. Opposite property. What's that? Uh, well, this is that positrons, electrons have this opposite property, and whether you call it left or right, or up and down, or black and white, or it, it's well, it, just it, it's, 
it's specifically the the spin of the rotation of of the pattern because that's and that comes out when you try to like i said you give it a linear acceleration the magnetization field that will come out of it will be of opposite polarities and that's where it shows that's where you can really see that the positron and the electron have a different characteristic uh, they are essentially the same mass, but they have a different spin. And it's it's about the spin that makes the difference. And it's about the spin that makes the difference in a lot of things with the difference between the matter matter and antimatter. Other well, than that, other, yeah, well, other than that's the, what other I'm agreeing the spin with. Are essentially the same in all, all respects. It's a bit arbitrary whether you, you call one, one thing and one the antiparticle that or the other way around. But when you say... Um, you could question the whole basis of matter versus antimatter. Well, then, uh, then that's quite interesting because one could say, well, why is there not a, a world consisting of antimatter? Because, as like I said, if if you have a universe that can spin, rotate, it can either rotate in a, in a clockwise direction or a counterclockwise direction. But if the entirety of the universe is rotating and actually it's not rotating it's it's uh it's processing it's both as a double rotation uh in a clockwise direction then the contents of any wave patterns within that in within that universe are going to be inertially rotating in a counter or not you know again uh processing in a counterclockwise direction it's much like when you, you look at a, a bucket of water uh from a standpoint of if you spin the bucket of water the molecules each individual molecule within that water will begin to obtain a rotation a rotation of its own in a counter direction of the spin of the bucket and therefore you have well, everything within the bucket is counter rotating and that gives you a universe that only rotates in one direction for the most part. You can have collisions in there, which will okay, short, briefly make things rotate in the opposite direction, but because they live in a universe that's all rotating in one direction, they won't last long. If they collide with anything, they will annihilate because they're rotating uh, the wrong way. Do you think that the, the um, sense of the rotation in the first place of the universe, you call it, is uh, just by chance or arbitrary? What, why is it one way rather than the other way? It, 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 it's arbitrary. It doesn't really matter which way you rotate. The thing is, you, it can't rotate both ways at the same time, can it? Well, the problem with rotation is that it's plane dependent. And if I'm looking at something rotating this way, I'd say it's rotating right. Right, uh -huh. uh, likewise. And if I look at the other way, I'd say it's looking clouder. But, 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 I, but I made specific reference to not just rotation precession all right that's a well, double that rotation would be like something moving and that would be even more confusing okay. no 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 that, that would be a if you look at a clock and it's rotating okay and it's and it's go, going clockwise okay and now you take that clock and you take it on its 612 axis and you spin the clock also looking down from the 12 axis down to the six axis and you spin that clock clockwise now you have a unique double direction that cannot be looked at but in one specific way the two planes together rotating processing make it unique okay it's well i just got i can that not, it's not just a rotation it's a procession it's a procession that's important it's a procession that occurs in an electron it's a procession that occurs in a positron and that's why when you accelerate that processional pattern in a linear format it flattens out and it starts to rotate in a plane and it gives you a north south magnetic field it gives you a clockwise moving uh clock or a counterclockwise moving clock hand because it flattens out the rotation the processional uh, motion becomes preferential to a rotational motion that's perpendicular to the plane, uh, perpendicular to the direction of travel. The faster you travel, the flatter, flatter it becomes, the more rotational it becomes in a singular plane, the stronger the magnetic field becomes. Okay, so you can, you can separate the positrons from the electrons, 
So now you just have to explain why isn't I put two positrons together? They have this tendency to uh, run away from each other. Because they are both <laughs> rotating, they're both processing in the same direction, which basically yeah, weakens no. the field, which weakens the field more than if they're rotating in opposite directions. And like why? If they're rotating in the opposite directions, because that, that makes the field stronger. I mean, you basically just said that they do because they do. I mean, if I sit here and rotate, you know, any object in, in, in here, and if I have the same object and I rotate it in the opposite. I didn't say, I didn't say they do the, do Franklin, they, they do. Please. I, said it, I said it strengthened the field or weakened the field, depending on whether they're cooperating in their rotational direction or, or uncooperative in their rotation direction. They want, if they're both rotating in the same direction, they're actually stressing the field twice as much and so the field can't handle that stress so they move apart into an area of the field where they're not interfering with each other if they so the same is true an electron or two electrons are rotating in the same direction so they're causing stress on the field in the same direction so they'll move apart because the field outside of the, the field between them is going to be stronger because it's not being stressed by them. So they move apart into their own area where they can stress their own field, the, the field on their own where it's stronger. If they move together, then the field will become weak and not be able to support them. And so if that, and that's why two positrons will repel and two electrons will repel, but two pos a positron and an electron will love each other because they're not stressing the field in each other, they're augmenting their own field and they'll come together and they'll annihilate. They'll, they'll be so happy with each other they, they, that they'll annihilate and disappear and go off into a, into a gamma ray. Well, how do you envision this field? Is this an actual flow of something or do you know? I envision a field like a tension field. Like the surface tension of the water is a single dimensional tension field. It's a tension field in all directions. So it's which way would it be pulling between two positrons spinning in the same direction? I I just can't imagine because tension would be like you have a sheet and you're you, you went you went from a simple tension field between a couple of bubbles that you didn't understand, and now you're trying to understand a complex rotational compound tensional field of longitudinal transverse wave combinations, and say how does that happen? Yeah, how does that happen? I'm not even going to try to explain to you because you don't even understand the simplicity of how tension even moves together. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, like I said, I understand tension as being if I if I take a, a sheet of paper and I, I pull it, that's tension. That's along two lines on a. On yeah, OK, a, like I said, I'm not going to even try to explain it to you, Aunt Franklin. I gave it to you years ago on a couple little bubbles on the surface of water, and I showed you how tension in a surface of water could come together because of the tension redistribution, or if a, a negative meniscus and a positive meniscus would repel each other because they increased tension, surface tension if they moved together. It's as simple as that, and it's no, more, no different except for now with the electron and positron, the tension patterns are actually, vi are actually vibratory waves, and they're moving in a surreal of serility or in a processional pattern. Once you understand how tension works, we can get on to electrons and positron complexities. You're not going to understand how any of this works until you understand how tension works. Okay, so Harry, what do you think of that? I think it's interesting, worth uh, thinking about and understanding more. Um, I. You know, I, I think what Cornelia says is interesting. It's certainly worth thinking about. How about uh, Ian? What do you think of that? Plausible, not plausible, understand, don't understand what? Well, you've put me in the spot in a way. I, I, I mean, it, it's certainly plausible and maybe uh, Harry's response is the correct one that it's worth thinking about. Uh, I think maybe Cornelius does a bit um, overdo this this whole tension business. 
I, I, as I say, it's, it's quite plausible. But as an ultimate explanation on this business of chorality of, of the universe and so on, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a particular model, and uh, it obviously has some analogs with our daily lives, so uh, it's plausible in that sense. But um, I'm not sure if, if, it's, if, if it's really the ultimate answer. I mean, one, one might as well talk about compression, which is the obverse of tension as being the fundamental... Um, no, you can't talk about compression because compression does not converge. Tension will converge. If you, if you stress something, and a, tension, a stress strain test, the tension will converge. It'll weaken the ten it'll weaken the material, and you'll see a necking going down in the material, and that tension will converge to a point. You need to you, I, I, I look at tension because tension waves will converge to a point which can become a particle. A res a resonant point of the case. And there's a specific reason I spoke of tension. Uh, so you're right, it, you could talk about compression too. But compression doesn't seem to work uh, to explain uh, transverse waves through a uh, through a solid medium, which is which is uh, electromagnetics and light. And uh, compression doesn't ex doesn't explain or doesn't uh, won't converge on its own. It's divergent, which means that if you're going to look at compression, the energy source has to come from the point particle itself. Whereas if you're going to look at convergence. The energy source comes from the gravitational field itself and converges to become a particle, much like the energy source from a rogue wave in the ocean comes from the larger, longer wave waves in the ocean converging and making a rogue wave in the middle. It, so it's another I, example, I suppose, of, of the positive versus the antithesis or the negative. And right. it, it might be a useful model, uh, perhaps, Franklin, to. Um, to use in our analysis of, of some of these phenomena, I mean, whether it be wave mechanics or... Um, i got a question for Cornelius. Uh, when you talk about tension and the way you talk about forming particles, I sort of think of that, uh, um, you know, elastic plane that they use in general relativity. Are you thinking about the primary tension field as being gravity or what? Yeah, the primary tension, well, gravity itself is is uh, the gradient of wave pattern but yeah uh, gravity is is uh, is uh, the summation of all the uh, gradients of tension between the waves that basically are responsible for matter I and mean, how we, yeah ten, gravity is tension but it's the uh, average tension amongst the uh, amongst the waves between from wave to wave in that uh, if that, I'm not sure if I'm being very clear about that, but yes, uh, everything is a form of tension, and gravity is just the the uh, the average of all the waves. As I say, if you look at a uh, say, uh, oh, how do I do that? A dampened wave, for instance, Harry. Uh, gravity would be uh, a tendency to to uh, have a, a, a an attraction to, because if if you if you were to take a, uh, a a string, a rope, and you were to pull tension it, pull pull on it, okay, and then you then you then you wave it sideways uh, while it's pulled. Because of your motion going sideways, it'll actually also increase the the tension on it uh, lengthwise. Does that does that make sense? Because now sure. it, it's, the, the the rope has a greater distance to travel, but and so, so you get more a greater tension in that direction. Uh, hmm. So, so, well, so. Sounds like Cornelius, you have some interest in your theory. Uh, would you be interested in just giving us a presentation so that we can hear you out? Because obviously, we're running out of time. But well, I, I can try to talk about it. Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot written down about it, uh, which you you all know about me. I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not a, a journalist. Uh, so. I well, can that's try okay. to talk about it. If you'd uh, like to talk about it, because I, I need something to talk about, and if you don't want to hear me and Harry arguing the whole time, I think it might be more 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 interesting to uh, hear, you know, what you think. Because, like, like I say, I, you're right. I don't understand what you're talking about with theories and Cheerios, and but I'd like to give you a chance to uh, okay. fully explain, you know, how you get, say, the attractive forces uh, out of out of your theory. 
Okay, I'd, I'd be more than willing to do that. But if I if I do it, it would be like maybe then we only have an open week question, open weekend or something like that. I don't want to really schedule anything. Uh, I regularly go out to breakfast with my wife, and sometimes I'm getting in the middle of these. I don't want to make any commitments to this because I have a commitment to the family. Uh, okay. All right, but uh, if I'm if I'm here early enough in one, and there's not a discussion going on, and we want to go there, that's that's perfectly fine with me. I got recordings of way back when we spoke about this with Glenn Baxter in the 20 in, in uh, probably in 2015 or so uh, that uh, but they're not very clear. Do you have some of those recordings? Uh, yeah, I thought they were supposed to all be put on the uh, NCMP. Well, website, I think they all think got wiped out except for the one. I took a whole, I took some of the recordings that I copied off of his website before it went defunct. And, yeah. but I don't think there were, all of them were ever recovered. Well, the only, the only reason I remember those particular ones, and Franklin was there. Uh, I can't recall if Bill Lucas was there or not. Yes, uh, he was. Uh, I think Ron Hatch, I know, was was there in that conversation. And I can't remember if you were there or not. The reason I remember that conversation is at the time, it was probably the first time I really spoke uh, to on, on uh, Glenn Baxter's uh, show very, very long. Uh, I was in the, oh, I, guess I had, my question I had is, time on my hands. Recording? Because, yeah, I was, I, I was in the hospital at the time recovering for cancer surgery. And, and so that, that allowed me the time to speak and listen. Uh, I have, have a recording of that. I, I do. I can try to send it out uh, if you'd like, uh, but it is now, pretty I would like that because um, just on an aside, um, I, like I said, I downloaded a bunch of uh, uh, sessions, but they really were only things I was interested in. And okay. if you have. Well, you should have recorded stuff, me then, Harry. Huh? You should have been recording me then if you were, you must have been interested in me at the time. <laughs> I'm not trying to be okay. annoying, but I'm just I saying. I'm I did sure try to recover some of it. it. There was so much of it that I just couldn't recover at all. Mm, well, good for you. I, I, you know, there was those some good conversations at the time. Anyway, uh, I'll try to look. I've got very few of them. Uh, all right, like two or two or three is all. All right. Well, okay. well, Cornelius, I'll just take that as an open invitation. Uh, certainly, the, I don't think that we have any speakers next week. But uh, so, if you show up on the call, then uh, we'll just. Okay. Uh, Spend the time discussing what you want to talk about. All right. Uh, I got a comment here before we get on to the end. Um, I would be, it'd be helpful if you have some drawings that you can make. I, 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 I would like to have some drawings if you could. I fully agree with you, Harry. I, I, I uh, you know, maybe I can rig up some kind of uh, my little camera or something like that and try to draw something on a piece of paper as I go. Instead of, I'm not the journalist. I'm, I, I, if you were on front in front of me on a whiteboard, or if we were sitting at a cup of coffee and having having coffee, I, I could draw on napkins all you want. I'm just I'm just not a documentation type person. As a matter of fact, one of the recordings and the one I'm thinking about, if you listen to it, I think at the time I will have said that uh, Ron Hat to Ron Hatch that I owe you guys some documentation and. Here I am, uh, years later, and as you well know, there there is practically none other than a, a short, brief description of some of the stuff on the CNPS website. Uh, I was hoping for some conversations, and collaboration to go back and forth to make things clear as we progressed through the description, rather than just try to blurt it all out what is in my mind and 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 go. You know, it seems like I was hoping for some. Like I said, back and forth to know that people understood where we were at at the basis so that when we got to the more complex things, nobody would be lost. And that's what I was kind of hoping for. Uh, and my fault, you know, I, I'm just not a documenter. That's OK, uh, Tony, but that's exactly what we're here for. Actually, I, I think those conversations with uh, Glenn Baxter uh, occupied at least two hours as well. So obviously it wouldn't be possible to play it, but you could perhaps, Cornelius, uh, extract um, a relevant part, and maybe Franklin would would allow fifteen or minutes or something to uh, to play that back. I think it might be better if I just try to send it to maybe the people that might be interested, because 
its quality is really not that good. And I think if, if Franklin tries to play it back again, uh, it would be pretty uh, trashed. I can try to okay, send well, it to Franklin. Okay, well, I'd be interested as well. I can try to send it to Franklin and see whether or not you know he thinks it's usable or not that way. Yeah, send it to me. Uh, you know, uh, of course, it just takes a long time. Unfortunately, see, I don't even go back to my own uh, recording because I just simply don't have the time. I don't have. Yeah, time. it takes two hours to listen to them. Exactly. Yeah, it takes two hours to listen. To. I don't have that kind of time. Yeah. So, well, well, the good thing about having it. That, is it? Supposedly, good thing about having di supposedly, digital format, at least um, you can cut it out when you want to. Supposedly, ahead, David De Hilster copied these. Uh, this stuff that existed on the website and put it somewhere on the CNPS site. And I don't know where that is, but what I, but I don't think he got everything. And I think the reason that, that I'm bringing this up is because, you know, it would be nice if, if you have something that's not on the CNPS website, maybe it should be put there. Ah, it's only it's only two or three recordings. I you know I yeah, I but it's two or three recordings that aren't that don't exist anywhere other than with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, specifically, it's to your topic. So yeah. you know that it, if people want to know more about it, you could just say, "Here are my recordings." Or yeah, maybe you can make a transcript of it. The the the, the internet is amazing now. You can automatically transcript almost anything. Mm. Um, it, it'd, have to be to pretty much phone, right? <laughs> it'd be out to be a lot more audible than this one is, I think. I'll send uh, you a copy, Ian and Harry and, and uh, Franklin, at this point. Uh, if anybody else wants a copy, they can maybe email me and I can try to send it to. Ian, you don't have any recordings, do you? Uh, yes, I, I was about to say, Harry, um, I think I have maybe two recordings or maybe three two uh, just about my own presentation in 2013 and i think uh, it's your own uh, analysis of that i think you you, you harry and, and glenn um and uh, we we talked about this before um uh, just shortly after glenn died i think about maybe trying to recover all the information from his wife and i'm not sure if david de hilster followed anything up but it seemed to result in nothing um, okay. Yes, I, I know what it was as well. Um, I, I might have two conversations that, that he had, but there was one presentation, the presentation that I made to the NPA, which actually isn't a Franklin on the web now because after the split to the John Chappelle, and it was the earlier form, so I don't think it can be retrieved. If you go into the URL, it just says error 404. So I actually got that from Glenn, and I have it on the system, but I only have the audio of that, not the video. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's another tragic thing. But I, I don't know if it's too late. late. From the old period or gone. I mean, may, maybe they exist somewhere in the ether, if you like to use the word Harry, and it's not too late to try to go back and retrieve it from, from the service provider. I mean, my understanding is... Glenn paid uh, maybe not an insubstantial sum of money to have facilities for, for, the, for all the, the data uh, up, upload facilities. And his wife um, obviously discontinued that. But it might be possible to retrieve it if, if, if one was sufficiently... Uh, Actually, the, the uh, web pages are available on the uh, Internet Archive. But when you click on the links to, those, to the MP3s, they don't work. Exactly. Yeah, you're talking about the NPA ones, Mike. I just talked about the internet, archive.org, which, which crawls every single accessible page in the in the web and stores it. So, I think you yeah, can but it didn't, it didn't store the actual... Yeah, it didn't store videos. the actual... It didn't chase those that. That would probably have been too much. But in any case, we're getting towards the uh, end of our discussion today. So I think uh, initially Bob had brought up uh, this website uh, on YouTube, Sky Scholar. So if you're interested in astronomical topics, uh, that's the place to go. So uh, we started discussing the whole Big Bang thing as an astronomical topic. And uh, then we got into this, this philosophical discussion of if you believe in the Big Bang, that's a form of something from nothing. And whether you should believe in something comes from nothing. 
And uh, so I just wanted to end up uh, the conversation with the question about the chicken and the egg, which also came up, which is would also seem to be a form of something that so I, I thought about this and I, I think there is an actual correct answer. And so I would say definitely the chicken came first. And so the reason why I say the chicken came first is that uh, at some point there was some other creature that was not a chicken, right? Let's call it pre-chicken, whatever the thing is. So that has a certain genetic code in it. So, but at some point, uh, the, the egg and the sperm, the male and the female uh, cells had to come together and mutate so that they would have the genetic code that we currently recognize as being chicken, right? So we have those two cells, a mutation comes in, makes the genetic uh, makeup of the chicken. Now I would claim that at that point, that is when the chicken came into create into existence when its DNA was recognizable in that embryo, the first cell of the chicken came together. So in that way, then that embryo grew, then the, the, the not chicken formed the egg shell around the embryo, which then was then hatched into the chicken. So definitely the egg came second. The egg had to be formed around the already existing chicken, the chicken came first, the egg came second, and then it's just a fact that the chicken comes out of the egg, is, is not relevant to what came first. So therefore, the chicken came first, that's what I feel, so. And I'm sure Harry doesn't believe that, but okay, but I just wanted to end it with that. <laughs> All right, so, but we are out of time today, and uh, I thank everyone for participating. And like I said, if Cornelius is here next week, uh, we can start off the conversation because I don't believe I have anybody else scheduled. It'll be another open conversation otherwise. And if Cornelius can, uh, maybe this will inspire you to like, you know, write a few diagrams down or, or something. I think but because you're talking about something which is physical tension, uh, I, I would think that it would uh, make things a lot clearer to have some uh, pictures of what of what you're talking about there. But uh, that will be for next week. So, and that will do it for this week. So until next week, same time, same place.